This is week three of our series where we're asking the question, what in the world is going on? We're reading the newspapers, we're watching the news, we see amazing things happen every day. And what we've been learning the last few weeks is that these are signs of the times. Signs of the end, really. But the Bible gives us signs concerning the return of Jesus Christ. Two weeks ago, our, our topic was the signs of the times. Last week, we talked about what's going on with Israel and the Middle East. And today, our topic is what in the world is going on in America? Does anybody care to know what the answer is to that question? Amen. Let's pray one more time. Let's ask God to help us. Lord, we realize that these are amazing times that we live. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help me to speak your word, speak your heart, and speak with your spirit. Lord, give us ears to hear what the Spirit says to the church in these last days. Open our eyes, God, to see what's real and what's not real. And God, make us ready for the days that we live. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said amen. amen. Did you know that every day when the sun rises over Washington, D.C., its first rays fall on the eastern side of the city's tallest structure? The Washington Monument stands 555 feet in the air. The first part of that monument to reflect the rising sun is the eastern side of its aluminum capstone where these words are inscribed, Laus Deo. It's Latin for praise be to God. This small prayer of praise, so high in the air that it's only visible to heaven's eyes alone, is the clear recognition of our nation's unique acknowledgement of the place of God in our founding and in its continuance. President Ronald Reagan put it this way, I have always believed that this anointed land was set apart in an uncommon way, that a divine plan placed this great continent here between the oceans to be found by people from every corner of the earth who had a special love for faith and freedom. God's hand on America began with its discoverer, Christopher Columbus. In the rotunda of the Capitol building in Washington, D.C., there's a painting called The Landing of Columbus, which depicts his arrivals on the shores of the American continent. How many have actually been to this and actually seen this picture? Some of you have. In his journal, first of all, many people believe that Christopher Columbus was of Jewish ancestry. And in his journal, he wrote that his voyages were ushering in a millennial age and he was co firmly convinced that Isaiah 59, 19, which says, They shall fear the name of the Lord in the West, referred to the lands west of Europe that had not yet been discovered. His journals show that the primary purpose of his explorations was to take the message of Jesus Christ to the people of this unknown land. Now, you're not going to hear that in public schools these days, but that's history. What you're going to hear is Christopher Columbus excoriated by those in the politically correct crowd, but yet history tells us a different story. Throughout our nation's history, we see America's leaders turning to God for guidance. We see Washington kneeling in the snow at Valley Forge. We see our founding fathers on their knees at the First Continental Congress. There's the picture of Abraham Lincoln praying and calling the nation to prayer and fasting in the era of a national crisis. We see Woodrow Wilson reading the Bible late at night by the White House lights during World War I. George Washington put it this way, No people can be bound to acknowledge and adore the invisible hand which conducts the affairs of man more than those of the United States. Clearly, America did not become what we are by blind fate or random consequences. Can I say that again? America did not become what we are by blind fate or random consequences. A benevolent God has been hovering over this nation from its conception 
so that today we are the most blessed people in the entire world. Consider this. America comprises only 7% of the world's population and are in possession of more than half the world's wealth. America has 63% of the world's manufacturing goods, 74% of the world's automobiles, 52% of the world's trucks, and I'm sure a majority of them are in Indiana. I'm just seeing if you're paying attention. 56% of the world's telephones. A lot of them are probably here at church today, so keep them off. Remember that, all right? 47% of the world's radios, 46% of the world's electrical output, 52% of the world's steel, 35% of the world's petroleum, and consumes 35% of the world's energy. Now, there are two competing worldviews about that, and some would say, that's just not fair. America has all of this. Or you could look at it this way, that America is the most blessed nation above all other lands. America, in her short history, has outstripped the wealth, the power, and the influence of all ancient and modern civilizations. Let me say that again, because I don't think you heard me. America, in her short history, has outstripped the wealth, power, and influence of all ancient and modern civilizations. Would anybody agree America is blessed? But why? Why are we blessed? Why are we in this position? Is it because that America has been the most generous nation on the face of the earth? Certainly the facts back that up. We continue to be the most generous nation on the face of the earth. We even give money to people who don't like us. Is it because America has been a major force behind world missions? For years and years, America has been the launching pad of missionaries all around the world. Or is it because we're linked somehow with the nation of Israel? Is it because we've been a friend to the Jewish people? Because a major part of our history is Jewish history. I told you about the roots of Christopher Columbus. If you know about the American Revolution, you know that a large portion of the American Revolution was financed by Jewish men and women. Did you know, I'm going to ask that question a lot today. Did you know the majority of the nation's founders were Christians who viewed themselves in the same manner as the Hebrews who crossed the Red Sea to get into the Promised Land. You say, Pastor, what are you talking about? Did you know? In fact, Benjamin Franklin, among many others, wanted the national seal of the United States not to be the eagle with the arrows and the olive branches, but to be an image portraying the children of Israel coming out of Egypt. You may know that there are lots of cities and towns in America with biblical or Hebrew names. Hebron, Bethel, Salem, Zion, Shiloh. There are lots of Jewish roots in America. When the nation of Israel was declared a sovereign country in 1948, we've talked about this pretty much every week so far, right? It's a big deal. Surrounding Arab nations immediately declared war on the new nation. So Israel declares independence one day. The very next day, the Arabs declare war on them. Few people felt Israel could survive, and most Western nations didn't want to become involved in the conflict. So as a result, many nations chose not to publicly recognize the existence of the new state of Israel, except the United States. President Harry Truman was raised in church. And he had a mother and a grandmother that helped teach him the Bible. And he knew that in the Old Testament, God had given the land of Israel to the Jewish people for all time. Now, there were many people in Truman's cabinet that were fiercely opposed to recognizing the new nation of Israel, including his powerful Secretary of State, George Marshall. When Israel's chief rabbi paid the president a visit in early 1949, this was after Truman recognized the existence of Israel. The chief rabbi of Israel pays the president a visit in 1949 and tells him, 
God put you in your mother's womb so that you could be the instrument to bring about the rebirth of Israel after 2,000 years. Now, if you're not paying attention yet, pay attention. And when that happened, history says, tears rose to the president's eyes. The rabbi then opens the Bible and reads the words of King Cyrus from the book of Ezra. Here's what it reads. The Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kindness of the earth and hath charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. One of Truman's aides was present at the meeting. His name is David Niles. He remembers that he thought the chief rabbi was, quote, overdoing it a bit with the comparison. But when he looks over at the president, tears are running down his cheeks. Another eyewitness to the occasion, Ambassador Eliahu Elath, recorded this. On hearing these words, Truman rose from his chair and with great emotion, tears glistening in his eyes, he turned to the chief rabbi and asked him if his actions for the sake of the Jewish people were indeed to be interpreted thus and the hand of the Almighty was in the matter. The chief rabbi reassured him that he had been given the task once fulfilled by the mighty king of Persia and that he too, like Cyrus, would occupy a place of honor in the annals of the Jewish people. The Secretary General of the United Nations of that time put it this way, I think we can safely say that if there had been no Harry S. Truman, there would be no Israel today. We could rephrase that and say, if there had been no United States of America, there would be no nation of Israel today. We know that the regathering of Israel into its nation is one of the greatest signs of the times that has ever been. And now we know that one of the major reasons that God raised up the United States was to help its regathering. The United States and Israel have been perpetually linked together. There's going to be a debate tomorrow night about foreign policy, I hear, a rumor. I would love for somebody to bring up God's foreign policy. Pastor, what's God's foreign policy? Here it is in Genesis 12. God says to Abraham, I will bless those who bless you. And I will curse those who curse you. That's pretty simple, isn't it? But that's God's foreign policy. And we need leaders who understand that. We've had pastors and teachers who understood it. As a matter of fact, President Bill Clinton had a pastor in Arkansas say this to him years ago. This was when he was Governor Clinton before he was President Clinton. Here's what uh, Pastor Reverend W.O. Vaught, pastor of Emmanuel Baptist Church in Little Rock, Arkansas, said to then Governor Clinton. He says, you might be president one day and you'll make mistakes and God will forgive you. But God will never forgive you if you abandon the state of Israel. Why do you think that the terrorists and the protesters in the Middle East, they don't just chant death to Israel, they chant death to America. They don't just burn American flags, they burn Israeli flags. How did we... How did that happen? Why are we connected to Israel? And why do they hate us so much? What does America have to do with Israel? Why? And what does this have to do with the future? Some of you have probably read this book called The Harbinger by Jonathan Kahn. How many of you have read this book? A lot of you have read it. This is a fictional book. It's not a theology book. Don't read it for theology. But... The, prep, the proposition is that there's a journalist who is visited by a prophet, and the prophet explains the warning signs of judgment that came to Israel, and the, and the proposition is that these same warning signs are appearing in America, and uh, uh, the, the, the conclusion is God is judging America. I think so. <laughs> Okay, so that part we get, we understand. But there's an exchange between the journalist and the prophet that I think really does a good job of of explaining or painting a picture of the relationship with America and Israel. Let me read it to you. 
the journalist asks, what does America have to do with ancient Israel? The prophet replies, Israel was unique among the nations and that it was conceived and dedicated at its foundation for the purposes of God. But there was one other, a civilization that also conceived and dedicated to the will of God from its conception. It was America. In fact, those who laid its foundations, journalists asked the founding fathers. The prophet says, no, long before the founding fathers. Those who laid America's foundations saw it as a new Israel, an Israel of the new world. And as with ancient Israel, they saw it as in covenant with God. The journalist replies, meaning what? The prophet replies, meaning its rise or fall would be dependent on its relationship with God. If it followed his ways, America would become the most blessed, prosperous, and powerful nation on the earth. And from the very beginning, they foretold it. And what they foretold would come true. America would rise to heights no other nation had ever known. Not that it was ever without fault or sin, but it would aspire to fulfill its calling by God. What calling, the journalists ask? To be a vessel of redemption, an instrument of God's purposes, a light to the world. It would give refuge to the world's poor and needy and hope to its oppressed. It would stand against tyranny. It would fight more than once against the dark movements of the modern world that threatened to engulf the earth. It would liberate millions. And as much as it fulfilled its calling or aspired to, it would become the most blessed, the most prosperous, the most powerful, and the most revered nation on the earth, just as its founders had prophesied. America and Israel are linked together. Okay, okay, Pastor, so you, you talked a lot about that last week, God's relationship with Israel, and now you're talking about America and Israel. So what does that have to do with the future? What does that have to do with prophecy? Where is America in Bible prophecy? We saw last week uh, in our message about what's going on with the Middle East that God clearly identifies several modern nations in prophecy thousands of years ago. Russia is identified. China is identified. Uh, uh, Syria, Libya, Egypt, all of those are identified in the Bible. But where's America? What's the future of America? Dr. Tim LaHaye put it this way. One of the hardest things for American prophecy students to accept is that the United States is not clearly mentioned in Bible prophecy. Yet our nation is the only superpower in the world today. Why would the God of prophecy not refer to the supreme superpower nation in the end times in preparation for the one world government, Antichrist? How many know that's a good question? There is some debate about America being identified in the last days. Matter of fact, I, I was going to bring to you my stack of books that I used these past few weeks in preparing for this message. There are all kinds of different theories and ideas, but there, are, there is no consensus among Bible prophecy teachers, as there are with other countries being identified in prophecy, there's no consensus with America. Most Bible prophecy teachers point out that the majority of prophecy in the Bible about the last days does paint a conspicuous absence of a Western superpower. Why? Why? Why aren't we there? What's the future of America? David Jeremiah wrote a book called, coincidentally, What in the World is Going On? <laughs> I say, Pastor, that's the name of your sermon series. You're right. I stole the title from him. Now, I thought it was a great title for a sermon series. Great title for a book, great title for a sermon series. And in his book, he lists four uh, he proposes a few possibilities about why America is missing from Bible prophecy. Number one, perhaps America will be incorporated into a worldwide or a European coalition. Most Bible prophecy teachers believe that, that the revived Roman Empire or the base or the seat of the Antichrist government will also be a consolidation of power from the West. Now, you say, okay, Pastor, you're getting in some terms I don't understand. Good. Come join us on Wednesdays. We're doing a class called Bible Prophecy 101, and we're explaining all of these events on this end times banner. Okay, so that will help you out. So 
the presupposition then is due to a likely economic crisis or some other crisis, we will either by choice or by necessity join a larger coalition of governments. That's one possibility. The second possibility he proposes is that America will be invaded or attacked by outside forces or be rendered helpless by God's severe judgment on us. Some maintain that the total absence of any scriptural reference to America in the end times is evidence that the America that we know will not be present. It will have been crippled by a nuclear attack, perhaps. We know that weapons of mass destruction or some other major catastrophe in the post-9-11 world, the detonation of a dirty bomb, a nuclear device, or a biological weapon on U.S. soil is not science fiction. Such an attack could kill millions of people and reduce the United States to a second-rate power in 24 hours. The same thing could happen if there was a severe national disaster earthquake or a series of natural disasters. The harbinger describes a lot of those of what the possibilities are there. But pastor, why would God judge the United States? Why would God send us judgment? Well, let me think. You can't help. You can't keep slaughtering millions of innocent unborn children at the altar of convenience. Now I'm going to stop right here and say, please no clapping for the rest of this sermon. Okay, this is, not a, this is not one of those messages. If you want to respond, you respond when we pray at the end. You come to the altar and you pray. That should be your response. We can't keep slaughtering millions of innocent unborn children at the altar of convenience and think somehow that God's not going to respond. The Bible says the blood of those innocent children cry out to him day and night. Get justice for us. And let there be no doubt, God will give them justice. Let me say this, and I know this is pretty strong, but in my opinion, to vote for any candidate who who is for abortion of convenience is to vote for judgment on the nation of America. Here's the third Possibility. Dr. Jeremiah says, well, America could disintegrate from moral decay. He says, the average lifespan of the world's greatest civilizations from the beginning of history has been about 200 years. In his book, The Decline of the Roman Empire, author Edward Gibbon compares Romans' fall to America's and what contributes to a nation's demise, including the undermining of dignity, the sanctity of the home, and the decay of religion. Did you know no army ever invaded Rome? They simply disintegrated from within. Our country is a little bit more than 200 years old. And we are quickly racing toward a radical redefinition of family. Now let me stop right here and say, People think what they're voting for are the rights of people who are not like us. Gay rights, homosexual marriage. But you need to understand, and and let me just stop right there and say, there are probably a lot of us here that have fellow students, neighbors, coworkers, who follow that particular lifestyle, and you say, they're nice people. And absolutely, they're sinners, and, and they need the grace of God just like we do. Come on, somebody. So we need to understand that. So we say, what's the big deal about this stuff? Here's the big deal. You need to understand that it's not about rights. It's about shutting up the church of Jesus Christ. Now watch this. Pastor, uh, what's his name? (laughs) Jim Garlow, the pastor of Skyline Church in San Diego, the church where John Maxwell was the pastor. He said, the redefinition of marriage and religious liberty cannot coexist in the same nation. Can I say that again? The redefinition of marriage and religious liberty cannot coexist in the same nation. It's not about rights. 
It's about shutting this down. It's about not being able to speak the truth. Number four, Dr. Jeremiah says, what could happen is that America will be crippled because of the rapture. If you were here last Wednesday night on our Prophecy 101, we talked about the rapture. John Muncy showed us a video, scared us all half to death. It was great. <laughs> it's estimated that at the rapture, America will lose millions of citizens. Think about it. All of its Christians, followers of Jesus, and all small children. Did you know that there are many major leaders who are followers of Jesus in every level of government? That means when they disappear, the economy would be crippled, the military would be non-functional for a time, and the media would go on unhindered. I wasn't intended for that to be funny. I'm not sure why you thought that was funny. <laughs> no one will be left to speak up for Israel. No one will be left to speak up for righteousness. It, it will be like a reverse surgical operation, one in which the healthy cells are removed and only the cancerous cells are left to consume one another. Now, as we look at those choices... Which one would you choose? This is not a vote. Just, that was a rhetorical question. I mean, as a believer in Jesus, I'd rather get out of here in the rapture. But how, how do we know what's going to happen? The answer is we don't. That's why it's just speculation. Here's what I do know. As long as America stands with Israel, none of those first things are going to happen. But if the current administration continues in power, you say, okay, here you go, Pastor Wayne. Why would you address the current president? Well, first, any president of the United States the richest and most powerful nation in the world right now, in the last days, is going to play a major role in the end times and prophecy. Second, this particular president seems to be playing a major role in the shift of who we're going to support in the coming end times war, Israel or enemies. So let me back up and say this, and remember, don't respond. If the current administration continues in power, I believe that all of these end time events that we've been talking about will accelerate. What are you talking about, Pastor? Well, President Obama spoke to the United Nations a few weeks ago, and he said this. The future does not belong to those who slander the prophet of Islam. What does that mean? Well, we know that he was referring to a, a video that has become major news. But if you think about what he said, who are those who slander the prophet of Islam? Anybody who does not accept Muhammad as the prophet of God. Um, that's me. That's you. You may remember a sermon I preached back at Easter season time. We talked about the difference between Jesus and Muhammad and other religious figures. To say something like that, President Obama says, the future of the world does not belong to me. I hold in my hand an article that many of you have probably read and seen that it's called America's Most Biblically Hostile U.S. President. And in this article lists 55 different ways that President Obama has led acts of hostility against people of biblical faith. Just look it up online. The most hostile, biblically hostile U.S. president, and you can read more about it. This president rejects God's role and the foundation of America. This president rejects America's strategic partnership with Israel. 
this president's administration rejects God's word and has even banned the Bible from some government enterprises. I'll never forget the day a few years ago when Congressman Mike Sabra walked through that door. He was teaching a class on the Constitution on a Wednesday night. It was an elective class. He goes, Pastor Wayne, do you realize today the Bible has become contraband on U.S. military bases? Boy, he was fired up. I could hardly believe what he was saying. The graveyard of history testifies that God rejects nations who reject him and reject his word. So, what do we do? What in the world is going on? How do the people of God respond? Well, it might not be what you think. Because we get our answers not from the news and not from those who have the same political persuasion as you do. We get our hope and our answers from God's Word. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and we've, we've taken time every Sunday in this series to tell you different passages of Scripture that gives us encouragement. But I love 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 6. It says, So then, let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be alert and what? Sober. Sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be what? Sober, Sober putting on hatred and selfishness. <laughs> Gather up your guns and get an exit strategy out of the United States. Is that what it says? Put on faith and love. The response of the people of God is two things. Make sure you're building up your faith and make sure you're maintaining the heart of... Come on, you can say it. It's good for you to say it. Faith and love. Love. And the hope of salvation as a helmet. Mike Evans wrote a book called The American Prophecies. He put it this way. The Bible doesn't tell us what the future holds so we can sit back and let disaster strike but rather so we can prepare and take any necessary actions to make sure we're on the prophetic side of blessing and not cursing. It is up to God-fearing Americans who are willing to step out and make a difference to keep our country headed in the right direction. I don't think you got that. I'm going to read it again. The Bible doesn't tell us what the future holds so we can sit back and let disaster strike. I'm not preaching this series of messages just to wig you out and make you scared. The Bible says, tells us about the future so we can prepare. Everybody say prepare. And take any necessary actions to make sure we're on the prophetic side of blessing and not cursing. It is up to God-fearing Americans who are willing to step out and make a difference to keep our, our country headed in the right direction. So what, is, what are we supposed to do? What's the appropriate response? How should we react in the days we live? Three things. I finally got to a point where you can write something down. Are you ready? Number one. Let your prayers be heard. Let your prayers be heard. The response of the people of God is always first to pray. 2 Chronicles 7 verse 14 is a familiar verse that many of you know. Would you quote it out loud with me? If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and heal their land. That verse is our hope. If we will, God will. History tells us that when the people of God cry out to God, He hears and He answers. The Bible says in Exodus 2.23 that the children of God cried out to God for a deliverer from Egypt, and the Bible says He heard their cries. Would to God that a generation of Christians would begin to rise up and begin to cry out to God and not give Him rest day or night and say, Lord, deliver us. Send us help from the sanctuary. Send us your blessing, your strength. Remember us, God. A couple weekends ago, I was in Washington, D.C. and had the opportunity to see this tent right behind the White House. It's called David's Tent. 
And uh, somebody had told me about this, so we walk around behind. This is in the ellipse. If you've been in Washington, D.C., this is in the ellipse right behind the White House. And I'm not sure the organization or the name of the people that put this there, but for 40 days leading up to the election, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, there are people worshiping and praying and praising God. I'm walking around going, hey, that's pretty encouraging. Because sometimes we tend to think the whole world's going crazy. No hope. And then you're reminded, hey, God's got some people praying. So when you pray for this nation, you're not praying by yourself. You're joining an army of believers who are saying, God, restore. God, revive. God, heal this nation. There's a national prayer initiative called 714 that I want to challenge you to be a part of. It's based on 2 Chronicles 714, and it's simply this. Every time the clock strikes 714, you stop whatever you're doing, and you pray for America. You pray 2 Chronicles 714. You pray Daniel chapter 9, Daniel's prayer of repentance for America. You stop and you pray 714 in the morning and 714 in the evening. I wonder what happened if all of us would do that. Every day, twice a day, we would simply say, God, restore, God, heal. Matter of fact, here's my challenge to you. What do we do? We need our prayers to be heard. How many of you will join me through the rest, of, at least through the rest of this year, not just to the election, because no one person's going to save us. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. We need God to save us. We need God to help us. How many will join me and say, 714, I'm going to pray. I'm going to do my best with God's help. God help you. God help you. How many are going to pray and do your best to pray? God, are we deaf? Are we stiff-necked? Do you not understand the days that you live? And you're going to sit there and be apathetic and let all of these things happen? When God has placed in our hands the power to turn it around. It's called prayer. Prayer. Doesn't matter how old you are, doesn't matter how young you are, you can pray. Now, I just rebuked you. Now, how many of you are going to say, I'm going to do my best to pray? That's what I thought. <laughs> Number two, I'll calm down. <laughs> Let your prayers be heard. Let your vote, vote be heard. Did you know the Bible is filled with people who participated in government? Nehemiah, Daniel, Moses, many others. Our nation was founded on the Christian principles of equal rights and equal representation. So that means that we need to let our vote be heard. Now, there, if you ask me, there are three Biblical issues, not just in this election, but in every election. The first one is Israel. If we stand with Israel, we're blessed. If we abandon Israel, we're cursed. So that's it. It doesn't matter what, the economy, the shamanomany, jobs, equal, you name it. If we don't stand with Israel, it's over. Israel's number one. Number two is abortion. It's not a political issue. It's a biblical one. And number three is marriage and family. That should be the priorities of every believer in Jesus. Not political party, not economic status, not race, nothing else. Now let me just give you an idea of just how serious this is. Something happened this past week that is absolutely amazing. Billy Graham comes out with a political statement. Now, you got to understand, Billy Graham has been the advisor to presidents since forever. I mean, he's 90-some years old, so it's been a long time. He's been not Republican, not Democratic. He's been the advisor to all presidents. Look at this. This is from CNN. The most famous and revered pastor in America, Billy Graham, is calling on voters to cast a ballot for their faith. In full-page ads in the Wall Street Journal, USA Today, and other newspapers, Graham's picture appears prominently in the ads next to a copy that reads, As I approach my 94th birthday, I realize this election could be my last. It continues, I believe it is vitally important that we cast our ballots for candidates who base their decisions on biblical principles and support the nation of Israel. I urge you to vote for those who protect the sanctity of life, and support the biblical definition of marriage between a man and a woman. 
vote for biblical values this November 6th and pray with me that America will remain one nation under God. I was amazed by that. Because here is this man who has been neutral his entire life, but yet sees the issues that we're facing now to be so critical, he speaks out. That should tell us how serious these issues are. Come on, somebody. So we need to let our vote be heard. Some people say, hey, no big deal if I vote. I've heard way too many young adults say, I'm just going to let that to you. I'm going to leave that stuff to you guys, you older folks. Well, first of all, thank you very much for calling me older. I appreciate that. But you need to get your head out of the sand and recognize that all of these things are affecting you. They will affect you. They will affect your children, your grandchildren. Come on, somebody. So you need to let your vote be heard. I want to challenge everybody here to take at least one of these voter guides on your way out today. Eric Miller was here a couple weeks ago, and, and he told us that these would be coming. These are simply uh, guides that tell from, a, from an Indiana perspective, Senate, House of Representatives, state, and local races, uh, based on biblical issues, they respond yes or no, they support or they oppose. Or they said, we don't care enough to actually respond to the survey, which to me makes a huge statement. And so I want to encourage you to take this, use this as a voter guide when you go to vote November 6th and pass out about 100 to coworkers, classmates, people who vote, uh, neighborhoods, all this kind of stuff. Uh, how many of these did we order, Pastor? 10,000. Because this is important. This is huge. So on your way out today, I want to challenge you to take, don't just take one, they, they're, they're bundles and bundles of 25, take at least 25, pass out that many. Some of you want to take a box, some folks took two boxes this morning in the first service, blitz them in your neighborhood, do it obviously in a nice way, don't be belligerent, but say, hey, here's, it, this is not Republican, it's not Democratic, matter of fact, there's one particular office that some of you are voting for that nobody responded to either one, I'm going to leave that one blank. Because that boy needs to recognize that family's a big deal. Number three, let your voice be heard. Before we do that, we got a video. I want to show you. James Robinson has about a 45 second clip to encourage you when it comes to the election. Our nation's founders were moved by the spirit of divine providence with their differences to come down on a solid foundation that we have been blessed to build on. That foundation they established rebuked them. It was costly for many of them to change, but they landed on solid ground. The church and prayer and love and coming together, loving our neighbor, loving those we disagree with, and the church piercing the darkness and affecting every party. One of the biggest mistakes in the religious right, I was known to be one of the most visible leaders of what was called by the media, critically, the religious right. It appeared in the following years, and we write about it in Indivisible, to be an appendage of a political party, an arm of a party. Big mistake. The church is not an arm of a party. It is the force that impacts all parties, all people, all candidates, and all voters. You can respond to that if you want to say amen. Number three. Let your voice be heard. Let your prayers be heard. Let your vote be heard. Let your voice be heard. But pastor, Christians shouldn't get involved in politics. You may want to read the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah if Jeremiah were alive today, he, well, he would be all up in people's faces. <laughs> Because that's what he did. In king's faces, governor's faces, telling him, thus saith the Lord. Anybody read about the prophet Nathan who goes to the king? You're the man. People of God have always been involved in political issues. And you know, if churches never spoke about political issues, there never would have been an American Revolution. 
If God didn't care about who was in office, then He must not have cared about Herod and Pharaoh killing all of those babies. If a pastor or a Christian speaks up about scriptural issues like family, like marriage, like abortion, that just happens to be political issues of the day, don't label what's biblical as political. If I would have said 50 years ago that abortion, the murder of a child in his mother's womb, is a bad thing, it would be wrong. People would have said, of course it is, pastor. But you say it today, and some might say, pastor, you are too political. If I would have said 30 years ago that the practice of homosexuality and the redefinition of marriage is wrong, they would have said, of course it is, Pastor. Say it today. And people say, Pastor, you shouldn't talk about politics. If I would have said 10 or 15 years ago, marriage is only between one man and one woman, the vast majority of Americans would have said, of course it is. Say it today. And people say, Pastor, you're being too political. What in the world is going on? Because the line keeps moving keeps moving until sometime soon you can't say anything without being political. Here's the problem. The people of God can no longer recognize the difference between what's biblical and what's political. You lay all of your political loyalties at the cross. I don't care what your mama voted for. I don't care what your granddaddy voted for. I don't care who said what about what. You lay them all at the cross. And you vote according to the principles of God's Word. A couple weekends ago, I shared with you that I was in Washington, D.C. Pastor Jason and I were there for an initiative that the Assemblies of God is launching for children's ministry. I'm going to show you a video about that in a couple weeks. It's very exciting. But uh, we went to the White House. We had some free time. Went to the White House and took a couple pictures. And we met this guy. Uh, we're taking pictures, and, and we hear this guy in this sandwich board. Uh, he's, he's got a group of folks gathered around him, and he's just talking to him. And uh, as you can tell, he's wearing this sandwich board. Uh, it says the same thing on the front and the back. Marriage always equals one man and one woman. So you're standing in Washington, D.C., in front of the White House, and wearing this thing. And he's having this conversation. We're taking pictures, and we're overhearing this conversation that this guy's having with these folks. And he asks him questions like, uh, so, so let me get this right. In order to become homosexual, you can become homosexual, but you can't go back. So this is a one-way street is what he's saying. Right, right. And they're like, uh, never thought about it that way. So he keeps asking these questions questions. He's extremely respectful. He's very funny. And all of these people are loving him. There's a crowd around him. Okay. We had to wait for the crowd to go away for me to even go talk to him. And I went up to him and I said, I said, man, I just, I'm a pastor from Indiana. And I just want to tell you, man, I am so thankful that you're out here doing this. And he goes, he goes, brother. I mean, he bugs me, brother, brother. He goes, I'm from California. God. Well, yeah. That's what was my response. That was my response too. And he said, he goes, he goes, I love Jesus. He said, God told me to come out here and stand in front of the White House for 40 days and talk to people about this election. And this is day 26. I got 14 days ago, and then I'm going home. And I walked away going, You got this, God. We tend to think, oh. Everything's falling apart. Nobody's doing nothing. And yet God has people praying. God has people talking. Does God have a voice in America? He does if he has yours. And if he doesn't have yours, he doesn't have a voice. God wants to speak. God wants to speak to this nation. How in the world is God going to speak? If you speak up, and if I speak up, I realize that a message like today is different, and it's no fun. If you think that somehow I get some sort of kick out of having to say things like this, then you don't know me, because today's message is a burden. And now it's your burden. What are you going to do about it? How are you going to respond? 
well, I just don't know what's going to happen. No, that's the wrong response. The response, the Bible says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin. I will hear their land, heal their land. Let there be no doubt, God is looking down America. In his eyes, same covenant as with the nation of Israel. Are there any, is there anybody? Where are the intercessors? Where are the people of God? Pray, because if we won't, he has no choice but to judge us. You say, Pastor, that's heavy. You better believe it. It's on you today. It's on me today. Who will pray? Who will fast and pray? Who will cry out to God for the nation that he created? Is there anybody in this room today that will come to this altar and join me and begin to pray for this, right, this nation? Join me now. Join me now. Young, old, everything in between. Come and kneel, cry out to God. Pray for our nation. Come on, church. Lift up your voice. God, have mercy on us. If you need to get right with God, you cry out to God right where you're at. God, forgive me. Make me part of the solution. Change my heart, oh God. Give me a right spirit. Forgive us, God. Come on, pray the prayer of Daniel. Forgive us, God. Forgive us, God.